Liberty Medal ceremony. Great. It was indeed great. It was spectacular. It was a time that reminded us of the best of America. So many people who saw it said afterward, this is what America needs. And I think what they meant by that is the vision of these two great statesmen, uh, John McCain and Joe Biden, their longstanding friendship, their comedy, their commitment to work together on behalf of the public interest and the common good and to set aside party or faction was a vision of what the framers had in mind and a vision of what this country needs now. So I'm so glad that you were all able to share it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if, as if that wasn't a night, well, here, actually, here's something I want to do after last night's ceremony. Those of you who've been here before know that I often ask you to recite along with me the motto of the National Constitution Center. And we need to do that for our two very distinguished visitors who are listening backstage. But last night, I recited the entire motto. There are some words that come after the ones that you know so well. And I think I want to add that to our collective uh, prayer <laughs> Be because uh, it really is a reminder of exactly what we have to do together to spread the light about constitutional understanding. Here's the entire motto. So here we go. You know the beginning. The motto of the Constitution Center is, it was the only institution in America started by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And here's the second part that you now have to memorize in order to increase understanding and awareness of the US Constitution among the American people. That's the point. The reason this place was created on a nonpartisan basis is so that we can spread the light and educate all Americans so that all of them, all of we the people can experience that moment of constitutional enlightenment that we experience here together in this theater and at the Constitution Center every day. So we have a joint mission, and it's an educational mission, and it is crucial, and it is necessary for the future of American democracy. You are lifelong learners. That's why you are part of this important center, and I'm so grateful to you for being part of this inspiring mission. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we now, having last night seen two of America's greatest statesmen, have the privilege of hearing from two of America's greatest journalists. And it's so exciting that to moderate our conversation tonight with the great Bob Schieffer, we have Maggie Hagerman from the New York Times. She is the New York, you didn't know what a treat you're gonna get, you think, for your membership, you know, you send in your wonderful membership and die a new, you know, that it would have been enough <laughs> just to have Bob Schieffer. But in addition to that, we have, as his interviewer, uh, Maggie Hagerman. She's the great White House correspondent for the Times. She is a political analyst for CNN. She's been at Politico and uh, a lot of other publications, but she's distinguishing herself as one of the greatest uh, political reporters in America. So we're really lucky to have her. And she is here to interview, I, I, you wouldn't call him one of the great, greatest political reporters. This is one of the, 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 the founders of American journalism. This, if, if, if John McCain and Joe Biden have uh, analogs in the media, uh, Bob Schieffer has to be in the pantheon. He is, uh, uh, he's been a reporter for more than half a century. He uh, retired from uh, Face the Nation after 46 years at CBS News, 24 of them anchoring Face the Nation. He's covered all four beats in Washington, the Pentagon, the White House Congress, and the State Department. He's won almost every award in broadcast journalism, eight Emmys, the Edward Murrow Award, the Library of Congress Award. He's written all of these books, uh, uh, including This Just In, Bob Schieffer's America, and Face the Nation. Uh, he has this wonderful new book about overload, finding the truth in today's deluge of news. He'll sign copies. Please join me in welcoming Maggie Hagerman and Bob Schieffer. That was overwhelming. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for coming tonight to hear from a legend who I have the honor of uh, interviewing. Um, we're gonna try to make this more of a conversation than an interview, which yeah. I, I think is, uh, is okay by Bob. Um, begin by talking about the book, uh, because you're the rare American journalist who has uh, seen the changes of the last 30 years in technology. You have worked in a number of different mediums, including a podcast now. Uh, talk about the book and why you wrote it. 
I will, but the first thing I want this audience to know <laughs> is <laughs> this is maybe the best reporter covering the Got White it. House today. She it's, not, is, it's not true, but thank you. She is um, absolutely amazing. And uh, the stories that she and her best buddy, Glenn Thrush, <laughs> I mean, they brought a whole new uh, magnifying glass to the New York Times, and they are doing, you know, we all talk about journalism, and it's in trouble, and it is in trouble in, at many levels. But these two are the best advertisement for journalism and what it ought to be these days. And Maggie... I am honored to have you here today. Thank you. This is the way I, I get to, don't ask hard questions, okay? This, this worked really well, because we're, we're, we're just gonna talk about who we think is good in the White House right now. Um, first, talk, first talk about the book, um, A, what the story you were hoping to tell, um, and I'll ask you about specifics, but what compelled you to write it in the first place? You know, um, I had been doing this series of podcasts called About the News for CSIS, the uh, think tank in Washington, and uh, John Hamry, who is the uh, chairman of CSIS, I was having coffee with him one day along with Andrew Schwartz, who's his communications chief, and he said, you know, I am so worried about the state of journalism right now and the information people are getting. He said, I, I think it's become a national security issue. And I'm not sure I'd really thought of it in that way, but I, I think he was right about that. And so uh, we decided uh, to turn these podcasts uh, into this book. And uh, so not everything in the, uh, in the book is, is from the podcast. I also did some reporting outside the podcast and so forth. Uh, and had, you know, had covered the campaign, just sort of observing and offering analysis uh, during the campaign last year. But what occurred to me was that this was the most, certainly the most unusual campaign of my lifetime, maybe the most unusual in American history. But it was all taking place while our industry, uh, the communications industry, was undergoing these profound changes with the coming of digital and the coming of the web, the shift from newspapers playing their traditional role. Uh, and I, began to think that this was having as profound an effect on our time as the invention of the printing press did on the people of that time. And we all think about all the good things that came from the invention of the printing press, improving literacy all across Europe, uh, it caused the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. What we sometimes forget, <clears throat> it had also caused 30 years of religious wars, and it was about three decades before Europe reached some sort of equilibrium. We're in the midst of something perhaps more profound than that, and we're not anywhere close to equilibrium now. We're kind of in what I call the first trimester of this, and we're all kind of feeling our way as we go. Nothing uh, has been more affected than our politics and our journalism, and so that's, that's basically why I, I wrote the book. The book's title is Overload, which is, um speaks for itself uh, to a point, uh, but you talk a lot about it throughout the book, about the almost sensory overload uh, that consumers get. Uh, and, and, and speak a little bit about that and how people yeah. can start to find their way through essentially this mess of different uh, news that they're getting and inputs that they're getting. And please don't think I'm being rude and checking my phone. His book is on my Kindle, which is what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. She's got sources. She's <laughs> got, I, I know what she's doing over there. <laughs> Not true. Uh, we have access to more information than any people who've ever lived on the earth at any one time in our history. But the question that I tried to examine here, are we wiser? or are we simply overwhelmed with so much information uh, that we can't process it? And at this point, uh, we're simply overwhelmed. Uh, the coming of social media, social media is a wonderful thing. Uh, it helps you keep up with your neighbors, it helps you keep up with your kids, but what we have to remember is that everything that shows up on Facebook has not gone through the vetting process that what you read from Maggie Haberman goes through or from what you might hear on CBS News. And uh, a lot of folks, I think, sometimes uh, just, well, I saw it on the, on the internet, so it must be true. 
uh, it isn't. And, and that's the part that, that is very difficult and learning to separate that uh, from the news we used to get from the uh, legacy news agencies, what I call the mainstream media. And it's, it's not all that easy to do because as you well know, Maggie, you know, these days it's not things, there have always been mistakes. There's always been gossip and all that kind of thing. But now we have sites on the web dedicated to putting out false information that is false by design, even by, for right. propaganda reasons, uh, for domestic uh, political reasons. And now we're seeing with the Russians involved in this stuff uh, put on there for, for basically national security reasons aimed at destroying the credibility of the press, which is one of the foundations of any democracy. And that's the part that, that's really concerning. Just as one example, you know, after this awful thing happened the other day in, uh, in Las Vegas, within hours there were stories circulating that this shooter who was misidentified in the beginning by more than one news agency, that this shooter had, had recently converted to Islam, that he was part of uh, Al Qaeda, uh, and even in the, one of the worst sins one can be accused of, said he was a real admirer of Rachel Maddow, mm -hmm. which I didn't know that was, was one of the original sins, but uh, I mean, I like Rachel Maddow. I think she's no, no. terrific. <laughs> so I, I don't mean to be saying it against her, but this is the kind of stuff that just pops up now. And as Maggie knows, once it's out there, taking it down is all but impossible. There are still people, who, a certain percentage of people who still believe Barack Obama was not uh, born in the United States. Uh, this awful thing that we had in Washington where this owner of this pizza parlor was accused of having a child porn ring in the basement of his pizza joint, uh, which was being run by Hillary Clinton totally without foundation, absolutely no way in the world that that could have been true. And yet somebody showed up from another state and shot one of the, the locks off one of the doors because he wanted to get into the basement to save these children. Well, number one, there is no basement in this pizza place. Uh, the police came, they took him away. Luckily, nobody was injured, but that story is still out there. And this man who owns the pizza parlor still has to have private security because he is still getting death threats. And that is the danger in all of this thing. How do we combat uh, as a profession? Because what you're talking about, as you say, are sites that are devoted to intentionally spreading falsehoods. The difference between us and sites, you know, us or you or whomever, is when we make mistakes, we correct them. Um, and we try to do them as quickly as possible. And sometimes they're incredibly embarrassing. Um, uh, one of us uh, on this stage, and it's not the one wearing purple socks, uh, recently uh, described uh, Chuck Schumer as the majority leader in the Senate. Minor, minor thing that we should have not made, um, uh, and obviously not intentional. Um, but uh, and you can watch your corrections ricochet around Twitter these days. Um, but how do you, com <laughs> when people, um, when people want to believe what is untrue? How do we combat it? What do you think the antidote is? By presenting accurate information. And that's really our only weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, reporters, uh, the White House and administrations are always trying to picture us not, this is nothing original with this one, is thinking we're the opposition party. Uh, we're not. And I don't know anybody in journalism who believes uh, that we are. Uh, Politicians deliver a message. Our role, our assignment from the founders was to check out the message and to understand there's a difference in the politician's role and our role. They deliver a message. Our assignment is simply to check it out, right. find out if it's true or false, and, and report on what the impact will be on the governed. And if we do that correctly, uh, we're performing a crucial part of our, of our form of democracy. Who wants a government where the only information comes from the government? We, nobody wants that. Our role is to present accurate, independently gathered information that people can compare to the government's version of events. And when we do that, uh, 
that's not only what we ought to do, and we're not always going to be the most popular person in the room, but you can't have a democracy without that. To me, Maggie, that is as important a role in democracy as the right to vote. Within that, um, part of the challenge of presenting accurate information, certainly in newspapers, but it's true now in the era of nonstop news on TV too, and every outlet has a website, um, the challenge is the speed. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about the tech revolution, about the shift from a daily newspaper with a daily deadline where there was a hard stop um, to the constant churn, where I, it's not even 24 hours, it's you know, no. three hours, two hours. Um, what we've gained and what we've lost. Well, what's happened, and you know, when I, when I became a reporter, uh, before Maggie even came along, <laughs> Her you parents be, may not right have even been that. married you by that be right time. About, you might be right about that. <laughs> that might be true. Uh, every town had three television stations and a pretty good newspaper. And maybe you didn't always agree with the editorial policy of that newspaper, or maybe when Walter Cronkite made that rare analysis or something, you didn't always agree with that but you assumed and you took it for granted that what was on the front page, what was broadcast on those uh, evening newscasts had been checked out and it wasn't, it wasn't broadcast or printed unless it was true. So people's opinions were based on those facts, on common data. Everybody made, got their, formed their opinion from the same set of facts. Now we're overwhelmed with all this information to, to the point where people who get their information from this source over here may get one set of facts and one set of data, and the ones who, who depend only on this source over here are getting a totally different set of facts and a totally different slant on it. So what has happened, and I think this is, is the main, one of the main reasons for this great divide in the country right now is, we are basing our opinions on separate sets of facts. We're not basing our opinions on common data anymore. And to me, that is the main difference of how it was when I was coming up and how it is now. Um, what, there's, there's one model you talk about in the book. Um, you talk a lot about local, local papers dying off or shrinking yeah. dramatically. Um, talk a bit about how much of that atrophy uh, has led to the partisan nature of the coverage that we've seen and people wanting to yeah. believe what their choice is? Uh, I think this is the most serious part because with the coming of the web, the newspapers lost the advertising revenue and especially the want ads. Uh, and that all went away to eBay and, and, and to the web. And so local newspapers uh, were having a difficult time finding the revenue uh, to maintain the kind of staff it takes to run a, a really good newspaper. We have lost, and I found some startling statistics when I started thinking about this book. I knew there was a problem. I didn't realize how serious it was. We have lost 126 newspapers over the last 12 years. In 2004, one reporter in eight lived in New York, Washington, or Los Angeles. That number now is down to one in five. One reporter in five lives in one, one of those areas, which you get out in, especially out into the Rust Belt of this country, uh, it's not a question of getting biased news, it's a question of getting no news. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's no news source out there. The local newspaper has gone away. Uh, yes, everybody has phones, but when you're in the lower economic uh, levels, you can't afford the news apps. I mean, I have the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, all on my, all on my, on my phone, and I look at them every day. I read those three, by the way, in the paper version. It's just generational, but that's the way I've always started my day. <laughs> but everybody who has a phone doesn't use it as a source of news because, for the most part, they just simply can't afford it. And now we're seeing what they call cost. Uh, cord cutting, uh, where the fees for cable has have grown so high that again, people in the lower uh, levels are not able to afford that. So maybe they have a television, uh, maybe they don't, but 
often their only connection to the news is, is by accident when their browser just sort of kicks something up and they see it or they see it on Facebook. Uh, when I started this book a little over a year ago, I think I went to the Pew Foundation, which is very good on stuff like this, and they told me that 62% of Americans now get at least some of their news on Facebook. I think that percentage is now up to 67%. I think that's correct. Uh, and a lot of the people who are getting it on social media like that, that's their only source of news. And it's just simply not always reliable. Um, <clears throat> one of the main uses of the term fake news came up in response to things that we saw on Facebook uh, that were spread on Facebook yeah. uh, during the campaign. The president has um, taken that term and uh, I would say appropriated it. And it, it's now used basically to mean any story the president doesn't like. Um, or any poll that he doesn't like. Or any poll he like. doesn't like or what have you. Um, was the term fake news in retrospect a mistake given that it's been weaponized? Well, I don't know. What, what would we call it? I mean, false news mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or just simply incorrect news, mm -hmm. but <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thing. I'd never, I'd never really thought about that, but I have to underline when the president talks about fake news, he's talking about something entirely different than you and I would talk about when we talk about fake news. He's often talking about something that's true that he yeah. wants to say is fake. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the distinction. Yeah. Um, you talk in the book about uh, a model that I'm, I'm familiar with from, from my time at Politico and my time at the Times um, that, that you're very enthusiastic about in the book uh, at the Texas Tribune, the, the model of journalism that they're practicing, which I'm hoping you can talk about why you found that to be uh, a rewarding concept for you know, dying industry statewide and whether that's applicable elsewhere. I'm not sure that uh, the model the Texas Tribune is following is, is the answer mm -hmm. here, but it is certainly, it's more than a Band-Aid, and it's certainly filling a void in Texas. And what I'm talking about, there's this uh, uh, fellow named uh, Evan uh, Smith, who is, was the longtime editor of Texas Monthly Magazine, and Texas Monthly uh, was a crusading, interesting, uh, did some very good investigative work uh, as, as a state magazine. They just, just covered uh, Texas, and they had a great, great stable of writers down there. Evan, and most of his friends thought he was crazy when he did it, decided to leave the job as uh, editor of the Texas Tri Tribune, and he said, I'm going to create this entity that gives away news. Well, wh who, what would that mean, we all thought. He went out, he raised money, and he put together this team of reporters in Austin. And today, they, when you go to the Texas legislature, more than half the people in the press gallery now will be reporters for the Texas Tribune. And then uh, the, the newspapers in Texas, the uh, television stations that can still afford to send a reporter to cover their state government, they're, they're, they're two. But what Evan does, and what's so unique about this, I guess, is they churn out these stories and give them away yes. to anybody who wants to read them, and to any newspaper that wants to print them. And like my, the old, the newspaper where I used to work, Fort Worth Star Telegram, uh, when you see an Austin byline in there, uh, most of the time, you will see uh, it said by Joe Smith, Texas Tribune. And they're doing that all over the state. And it's, uh, it's been a tremendous thing. And because many, many newspapers in Texas, a lot of them now will, will send, send a reporter from the home office to come and cover the opening of the legislature or something like that. But once, once that's over, they go back and they depend on the Texas Tribune. And, and the legislature there uh, meets only every other year. Right. So in that off year, there's literally uh, nobody uh, covering the governor and, and, and the state agencies, but the Texas Tribune has stepped in, they raise all their own money, uh, and, uh, and, and they're, they're really doing a wonderful uh, job. Uh, and I think, you know, here, here's another statistic I ran across when I was doing this book. In 21 of the 50 states now, there is not a single newspaper that has a Washington correspondent. 
So uh, that was an amazing statistic. And I, I have They're not never, covering their own congressional delegation. They're not I mean, covering their own congressional delegation. And that bothers even yeah. the congressmen. I mean, they, they, they would prefer, you know, to go their own way and not get a lot of uh, scrutiny. But on the other hand, uh, when they want to say something to the folks back home, who do they talk to right. now? They, I guess they have to call, call home. I, in South Dakota, do you know how many, Maggie, uh, this, is, this is, I think, the most surprising thing. South Dakota is not a large state, but uh, I was talking to a friend of mine out there, and I was talking about the Texas Tribune and so forth, and he said, well, do you know how many people we have in the uh, Capitol Press Corps in South Dakota? And I said, no, he said, one. There's one reporter for the Associated Press. He's the only reporter that Something. covers the South Dakota legislature, which I found just stunning. It's uh, terrifying. Um, <laughs> I want to um, <clears throat> shift backwards for a second. You, you cover the election and the, and the coverage during the election quite a bit. Uh, you quote one of my, my favorite uh, pollsters and, and uh, uh, data people to speak to, Peter Hart, about uh, what he had seen and what the impact was. Uh, and, and you don't draw a hard conclusion about whether the media sort of did well or didn't do well, certainly that we got things wrong, generally. Um, talk a little bit about uh, areas where, specific areas where you think the media performed well in 2016 uh, and where the media did not do particularly well. And it's again, it's not somewhere where you zero in hard in the book, but I am curious your... Well, I, and I, mean, I would say this if you were not sitting there, but I, I think there was some great journalism performed by the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, both of which have reinvented themselves, and, and, and they're no longer newspaper companies. Mm -hmm. They're media companies. Uh, I, went down, I wrote an op-ed for, uh, for the Post uh, during uh, the debates on what a moderator mm -hmm. should do, what the role of the moderator should be. I write the piece. It appeared in their digital uh, daily thing. It stayed up on their uh, digital website for a couple of days, and then, then it went away. And I called Ruth Marcus, who's the uh, assistant uh, editorial page. I said, is that it? Are we done? Oh, no, she <laughs> said, we've got, a, we've got a fine space for you on the op-ed page in the Sunday paper, you're gonna be very pleased. And I said, well, that's great. And then I get a call a couple of days later from somebody in the post video department. And the New York Times has a video department too. And they said, listen, we pulled a couple of uh, uh, sound bites from debates before. Why don't you come down here and we'll run, the, we'll run these clips and then we'll get your analysis of that. And so, Basically, the story I wrote appeared on, I think, in the, before it was over, five different platforms. This is very much the same thing mm -hmm. that's happening at the New York Times. I mean, I used to work at a morning newspaper. I know how it works. Uh, everybody wanders in about mid-morning, and you know, you have coffee, and then everybody goes out to cover their beats, and the, the big dogs have lunches with their sources, and everybody comes back to the office about 5.30 and writes their one story, and then they go home or someplace else. But uh, that's not how it is now. When I interviewed Elizabeth Mewmiller, who I've known for years, who's the Washington Bureau Chief for the Times, she's got, how many White House correspondents do you have now? We have six. Si we have six. Six? And I live in New York, so we have five and a half. Yeah, but no, you're, they have six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I think, I think the Post has seven. I think they, the reason they, they have seven is because the Times has six. I think, I think that that's probably I think that something, might be true. something to do with it there. <laughs> But Elizabeth was telling me, I mean, she has her first White House correspondent goes on, goes on the clock at 6 o'clock in the morning Sometimes now. Sometimes it's earlier. And she, but I mean, that's the, that's the start. Yeah. And, and they have an editor that goes on in, at 6, and, and they're on a tweet patrol. They're on tweet patrol, yeah. And I'm sure you all do much the same thing. Oh, yeah. We, one of, my, one of my, my favorite moments, actually, with one of my colleagues, Michael Shear, who is a wonderful man, um, but he's a... Uh, a, a profound uh, Apple product lover uh, in a way that I've seen very few people be. So he has an Apple Watch, uh, and at one point he was getting, uh, I think, Trump tweets in the shower, um, and that was that felt like a little much for me. But that's, but that is uh, that is a thing. Um, which gets me back to something I'd wanted to ask you. You mentioned before, um, in passing, about being referred to as the opposition party, and you said he's not the first to think of us that way or something to that effect. But I think he is the first to call us that. Maybe um, so. And yeah. But uh, yeah, 
That's probably right, but I mean, that was Bannon. Uh, but you know, yes, I mean, these names, I mean, you know, nattering nabobs mm -hmm. of negativity. negativity. You begin the book that way. <laughs> uh, that's, I mean, I've been called that, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, and, and <laughs> probably I shouldn't say this, but last week, or, or at one point during the campaign, I was called a female hygiene product. So, I, <laughs> in this campaign? Huh. So, you know, you can kind of, I, I mean, I've been called everything you can That's creative. Call. I mean, yeah, I, you know. Um, well, they used a different term. I, I figured, I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was three words. Um, I'm trying figured, to say this. Figured it? it was just one. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, they, that's part of the deal. You know, we all yes. get called these yep. names. I, it, it's just, it rolls off my back. But what really concerns me is when they go after our credibility. Right. They're going after the foundations of democracy. And I hate to be, I don't want to sound corny about it, but that's dangerous. And, and I've never seen it as intense as it is right now. That, and that's, that's what I was wondering, is if you had ever, I don't think we've seen a president um, handle it the way uh, this president has. I think that well, going, going directly, there, there have been, every president has felt they were treated unfairly. And every president uh, no has, president likes no president the press li while nope. he's president. Nope, nope. And <laughs> I mean, that's just part of the deal. No, um, although I will tell you, having covered this president before he was president, um, he never, he would never have said the words opposition party about the media prior to 2015 um, because he, he fed on the media in yeah. New York. Um, can I ask you? You can, uh, and then I'm going to ask you. You know, Maggie <laughs> came up to the New York tabs, and uh, she and, and Glenn Thrush, they worked for different tabloids. Yeah, but he worked for, he worked for the Duller tabloid. He worked, yeah. for, he worked for Newsday. <laughs> I was at the New York And Post. so you were dealing with Trump and, uh, during those years. Is he now like he was then? Do you sense any change? or? Um, it's funny, that, it's funny guys, it, uh, we've been talking a lot about this uh, as we approach the one year since the election, which is in a couple of weeks, um, he, I mean, I think he's very angry at the press. You, he's he's very, I, I don't think this is just shtick. I mean, I think sometimes it's shtick with the press and sometimes it's not. And we talked about this on a Times panel in DC last week that you don't ever really know, know when it is that it's genuine. Although when you're on the receiving end of one of his um, uh, bouts of fury on the phone, it usually feels pretty genuine. Um, but. Um, I think that he genuinely doesn't understand the role of what of the media uh, in government because when he came up um, in New York City, I mean, remember, part of why I think that the media and and certainly New York-based media missed what was happening with Trump to a large extent um, was that the five-borough view of Trump and how he had been known in New York City was so fundamentally different than how he was seen across the country from The Apprentice. Um, because people, people, I would talk to in Iowa. They would talk about him like he was this, like he was this major innovator and huge businessman, and not the person who, you know, had this building that was made out of, um, you know, uh, uh, concrete produced by a company that was supposedly mobbed up on the west side of Manhattan, or um, the person who had all these bankruptcies, or, you know, whose personal life had played out on page six, um, and. I think that he was so used to the institutions around him when he came up in, in New York in the 80s being fundamentally corrupt. I mean, the, the Ed Koch's um, government was, was very corrupt. And that, I mean, there were, there were corruption trials around it. That's how Rudy Giuliani came to rise. Um, and the New York Post, which was the main paper that he dealt with, um, a paper to which I owe my career, um, but it was very transactional. Uh, and so I think that he doesn't fundamentally understand the watchdog role. Uh, he just thinks of press as a means to an end. And that's what he learned from Roy Cohn, his mentor. Um, so it's not so much that I've seen a change, it's just that I've seen a, a constant state of frustration. Let me ask you this, uh, because this is, I mean, I don't Okay, and then I want to ask it. you something. Okay, but, but I, I, <laughs> I think people would be very interested in knowing this, because I'm very interested in knowing it. Uh, you deal with him a lot, and you talk to him a lot, from what I'm told. That uh, it's usually uh, on background or, or some way like that. Uh, what is he like to deal with? I mean, so I wouldn't, I would never comment on how often or not often I speak no. to someone. But, um, but in terms of him personally, I mean, this is the thing that I think. Um, one of the things that's been jarring for reporters uh, who didn't cover the campaign, and I would say that in, uh, 
the different, a main difference that I see between the New York Times and the Washington Post is that most of their White House correspondents did cover the campaign. And so they had came in with some understanding of Trump in a different way. Um, but people are so jarred by how he will go out and scream fake news, opposition media, or opposition party, the tweets and whatever. There'll be like seven in a row on a Saturday. And then he'll come to the back of Air Force One and be incredibly jovial and, and, and you know, ask if everyone's doing well and are you having a good time. And, um, you know, there was a moment, he can be very charming um, and he can be funny. And those are not the moments that we have seen a lot publicly uh, since he became president. But um, it is why he does better in sort of these smaller off-camera settings that we don't see. Uh, and he can, you know, it's, uh, so I point to one, one moment. A lot of this is venting. A lot of this is blowing off steam. When, when Glenn and I interviewed the president uh, in the Oval Office for uh, what was ostensibly an interview about infrastructure and immediately devolved into him making a, a specious allegation against Susan Rice or an unfounded allegation against Susan Rice and then talking about defending Bill O'Reilly. And then eventually we got to cars. But at some <laughs> point during this, and that's what talking to him is like. I mean, it really is sort of, he has this incredibly discursive speaking style, so you will follow him all over the place. But at one point he started, he makes these associations and that's just where it goes mentally. And so at one point he, um, I had a very uh, ill-advised moment on a Sunday show with George Stephanopoulos um, in 2015 where I laughed when uh, Keith Ellison uh, talked about his concern about uh, Trump as president. And it is true that in July of 2015, I did not think that that concern was sincere and I should not have laughed. It was a really bad moment, mostly a really bad moment because it went viral later um, because the congressman's staff put it out. Um, and someone showed it to the president, and this is one of the things with the president, is he will get something in his head, and he just won't get it gone. Um, and he brings it up almost every time I talk to him, and so he brought it up, it was like we were literally talking about like the Van Wyck Expressway, and then suddenly we were talking about George Stephanopoulos, and he said, you remember, you laughed, blah, 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 and I said, you bring this up every time. And Glenn, trying to <coughs> sort of make a joke, said, what, is, what does this have to do with cars? And the president said, oh, it's like therapy. And because that, and he does, he has these moments where he sort of vents and then he moves on. And so when he did that infamous press conference about Charlottesville in, in the lobby of Trump Tower, um, he, he was red faced and he was pointing at all of us and he was very angry. And then he wandered over to us in the press area behind a rope line and, you know, started making small talk about his winery in Virginia. So <laughs> it's, um, it's, it, uh, there is no experience I've ever had like interviewing him, and that was true prior to the campaign, and it's true now. So, can I ask you a question? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yesterday, uh, John McCain, uh, who has been making quite a, a bit of uh, news uh, from the Senate lately, uh, gave a speech here, uh, and he gave the, made this quote, or gave this quote, which uh, I have seen repeatedly over the last 24 hours, and, and uh, which I think was left a profound impression on a lot of people. <laughs> to fear the world we have organized and led for three quarters of a century, to abandon the ideals we have advanced around the globe, to refuse the obligations of international leadership and our duty to remain the last best hope of Earth for the sake of some half-baked, spurious nationalism cooked up by people who would rather find scapegoats than solve problems, is as unpatriotic as an attachment to any other tired dogma of the past that Americans consigned to the ash heap of history. So I took that, and I'm curious your take. I interpreted that as um, John McCain talking about the importance of American ideals. Um, I thought it was the most eloquent summation mm -hmm. of what America is about mm -hmm. and why America cannot withdraw from the world. Right. And, uh, I think we need a lot more John McCain's, is what I think. I, 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 I've, I've known John McCain a long time, and he's, he's for real. And he, uh, he says what he believes, and uh, I, sometimes I agree with him, sometimes I don't. But I thought that was just a fine presentation last night. And I, I, I was actually touched when I, I heard it on television uh, this morning. He was talking about, um, he was talking about policy 
and he did not mention the word, at least in that quote, Trump. Um, mm -hmm. The president, however, asked about this uh, earlier today on a radio show, I believe that's where it was, mm -hmm. um, took it very personally and said some version of, you know, he better watch out because eventually I'll push back and it won't be very nice. Or it won't be pretty, it won't be pretty I believe right. is what he said. Um, do you see... <laughs> Can I just tell you what? Sure. <laughs> Don't you know John McCain was just quaking in his boots? <laughs> Absolutely. My God. I mean, this man's a prisoner of war for seven years. I think he had three airplanes shot out from under him. Uh, spent a very... <laughs> had a wonderful career in the military. And, and is battling cancer. I bet that just scared him to death. <laughs> Do you, uh, <laughs> that aside, um, I, <laughs> that exchange seemed to me between the two of them, or it isn't really between the two of them, but involving the two of them, summed up, I think, um, this presidency more, more sort of uh, perfectly than anything I can remember, which is that most people in Washington still talk about institutions. Yeah. And President Trump talks about himself personally. Um, very frequently, and I'm wondering if you can talk about that a little bit and whether there is any analog in, in modern presidential history that you can think of. Well, I, I'm not sure there is. You know, uh, what, when I hear some of these things that he says, I, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, what does he hope to gain from that? Mm -hmm. what, what is the strategy here? How is he gonna better his cause by saying this? And I just don't understand it. I don't know why he does it. Uh, I, you know, a lot of times during the campaign, he'd be going down the road and things would be going pretty good. And then he'd go off on one of these things. And uh, sometimes it, it made a difference and sometimes, but he had a habit, you know, those of us in journalism, we talk about stepping on your own story. You know, a, a politician puts out a, a, a story and then somehow, uh, says something else in what he was trying to make a point about gets totally covered up by, by what he follows up. And, and time and again, we saw that. Now, I mean, part of that, uh, I think part of the reasons that he won is, and I talk about this in this book, there was this uh, political consultant in Australia named Linton Crosby, yes. and who later worked in David Cameron's yep. campaigns. And he had what he called the dead cat theory yes. of, of politics, and that is, <laughs> no matter what, if you're having a dinner party, no matter what you're talking about at the dinner party, if somebody throws a dead cat in the middle of the table, you're gonna start talking about the dead cat. And, and Donald Trump figured out how to do that early on. He'd go on the morning Joe, he'd go on these early shows, or he'd put out a tweet, and he'd say something, and no matter what the campaign conversation and what the issues were up until that point, He'd say something that totally changed the conversation, and people spent the way, the rest yes. of the day reacting to. I can tell you firsthand him. the news media, of other politicians. It yeah. was. Um, you also talk, and I think it was in that in that chapter about um, you talked about, <laughs> about the dead cat, but also um, there was what was striking about him was um, he kept coming back for more. It's not as if yes. I, I I know that there's a. A, a sense that, that he was not covered rigorously or aggressively enough, and I must tell you that I do believe voters knew a fair amount about him um, yeah. uh, by the time that uh, Election Day came And around. he pushed back. I mean, we pushed back. Mm -hmm. it's, not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not accurate to say, you know, we did give him a lot of airtime, uh, the cables. Do did. you think that was a mistake? Uh, do what? Do you think that was a mistake, to have given him that much airtime? Uh, he was news. Right. You know, he was news. Yep. And, but, you know, the, the other side of it was, uh, just because one person gets a lot of time, so why I, during, I, I asked Mika Brzezinski I, uh, of Morning Joe, I said, you know, you guys give Trump all this time, why don't you have Hillary Clinton on? And she said, getting an interview with Hillary Clinton is like getting an interview with Mother Teresa, uh, who's dead. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's Just true. FYI. <laughs> 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 You're good. 
<laughs> <laughs> but it is true. You know, I mean, we, 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 people say, well, why is he on all the time? Well, the reason he was on all the time, he figured out early on, if you offer yourself to enough television programs, you'll get on some of them. And by the time the Clinton folks figured out what had happened, it was simply too late. Mm -hmm. And it was too late by the time the other Republican candidates mm -hmm. figured it out. It was simply too late. He just rolled them over and, you know, people give him a hard time and he'd be back the next day if you, if you ask him back. And uh, so uh, there's nothing illegal about that. <laughs> uh, and he figured that out early on before anybody else did. And while I've never thought he was all that great a politician in the traditional sense, he really does know a lot about television and programming, yes. and, and he knew how to make his case on television, and, and he knew what he was doing when he did that. Um, switching gears for a second, do you think that the media, um, and you touch on this a bit in the book, but uh, I'd like you to talk about it a bit here, do you think the media was unfair to Hillary Clinton? No. Which her people do think? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, there's no, there's no campaign that I've ever covered, there's no story I've ever written, there's no interview I've ever done that I didn't think on reflection, I probably could have done it better. And there are a lot of things that uh, we could have done better, but I, I, really don't, I really don't think so. I, I like Hillary Clinton. I, I think she was eminently qualified uh, to run for president. Uh, I, I was a congressional correspondent when she was in the Senate, and I thought she was an excellent senator who represented her constituency uh, very well. Having said that, I do not think she ran uh, a very good campaign. I think she was running an old-fashioned campaign. Uh, you know, uh, the general rule is uh, in politics, you never want to put your candidate in a position where he or she may be asked a question they don't know the answer to. And so they were very careful about where she appeared. Uh, she didn't do the Sunday shows very much. Uh, that's kind of the old way of doing it. it but it's kind of like, you know, World War I artillery moving it around where you've got you know, you got mules pulling the, 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 the guns to get them from one place to another. <laughs> they just always seem to be kind of one step behind. And in the meantime, he's just running around. Uh, you know, he's over here, and when somebody's trying to challenge him over here, the next thing you know, he's over there. And uh, in the end, I, I, think, uh, I think the outcome of the election uh, had as much to do with the campaign that she ran as it did with the campaign uh, that that he ran and he, they just, it just didn't work. She was unable to ever craft a statement uh, that got through to those people out in the middle of the country uh, in those areas where, you know, if you lose your job and you don't get on at the Walmart, you're not gonna have a job. Mm -hmm. She never figured out what to say to them. She was never able to generate excitement among young women to the extent that I thought that she should have and that I think even Barack Obama did. And uh, it just, it was just, sometimes it, you just have a campaign, it just doesn't work. And uh, her, hers didn't, in my view. Um, I'm curious, and I've been thinking about this for the last 50 minutes, um, what is your main source of news at this point? Where do you get your news from? What's your news diet? Well, I'm old fashioned. I mean, I'm of a I certain age. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I get up and, and since I, my mother said that I read the, or my grandmother said I read the paper when I was in the first grade, it, that's a story too good to check, as we say in journalism. <laughs> I, so, but what, at a very early age, I started reading the newspaper and I always wanted to be a reporter. And uh, from the first time I wrote my first story when I was in the ninth grade, uh, for the junior high school newspaper, and I saw my byline in boldface type for the first time, and I thought, boy, that looks great. I want to see that again. <laughs> and, and from that day on, I just, I just always wanted to be a reporter. My, my girls, when they were little girls, my children, they used to say, Dad, did you want to be a TV reporter when you were a little boy? And I said, they didn't have TV when I was a little boy. <laughs> that didn't come till I was in the eighth grade. But. Uh, so I read the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. They're, they're delivered to our home, and that's what I've always done. My wife, who's an even more voracious reader than I am, uh, we do the same thing. And then I kind of turn on the TV, 
and, and see what the morning shows are doing. And, and I flip around a bit. I'm very partial to our CBS this morning, which is the best morning show that CBS has ever put on, <laughs> including the <laughs> unfortunate period when I anchored it way <laughs> back there. Uh, yeah, that's but, self uh, so, but that's just what I do. And then when I get to the office, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the wires. I have all the TV uh, channels up there on my, my monitors, but uh, I don't do it any, you know, there's no magic to it. I just like to keep, but I like to read. And I, I, I still learn most by reading. I mean, I think different people learn in different ways. For me, it, it's the written word, which is which why I, I love uh, writing books. I mean, I, I uh, you know, I, when I worked at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, I thought it was the best job anybody could ever hmm. have. And I thought that would be my, my life's work. And, you know, I later went on to do other things, but I always miss the writing. And, and, and our, our city editor, it, most, most newspapers, uh, police reporters, they're always out, you know, at some wreck or something. And so they don't have a typewriter, which is what we used to have. And so most papers in those days, the police reporter just called in the facts to the city desk, and the uh, and the uh, somebody on the desk wrote the story and put the reporter's byline on Sweetheart, it. Sweetheart, get me a rewrite. Yeah. Yeah, but our uh, our city editor, he always insisted that we work with the guy on the desk and compose the lead. And, and especially in police reporting, once you get the lead done, the rest of the story is just an elaboration on the lead. And uh, so I learned to do that and I learned to dictate and I learned to uh, you know, operate under a, by, under a deadline. And to me, those were, those were still great days. I, you know, I don't, probably at my age, I probably wouldn't get as much kick out of it as I did then. But. <laughs> But, you're, you're, but, you're but just, I have been to more car wrecks, I think, than maybe anybody in the history of it's Western probably, journalism. That might be true. <laughs> um, but what you're describing, and as I'm listening to you, you're describing a set of tools that you were taught, that existed yeah. to be taught at that yeah. time at a newspaper. I came up when those tools existed and when there were people to teach them. I think, and you touch on this in the book, that one of the most profound changes as uh, the tech revolution has swept across the industry uh, has been that we are losing experienced people. It been we are losing experienced yeah. people. We are losing experienced editors. editors. We are losing uh, ex people experienced in the craft who can teach the fundamentals of how to get it right, of how to do your job well. Um, the way to learn to write is to attach yourself who knows more about it, someone who knows more about it than you do. And in those days, uh, the Night City editor had been the police mm -hmm. reporter, and he got promoted, and that's he knew me from covering Rex, and so I, I took his place. Well, that's where I really learned to be a reporter. It wasn't in journalism school. My brother always said, you know, he's a lawyer, and he said, you know, uh, at law school they teach you to think like a lawyer, but you have to go to work at a law firm to learn how to be one, and I think that's how you learn to be a journalist and how you learn to be a writer, and having that editor help you every paragraph of the way. That's how you really learn. And because these staffs are cut down, mm -hmm. uh, there's so few people at the papers now that a lot of these young reporters, a lot of them go out now and write their stories and file it yes. before, before the editors even see it. Is that one of the top five things that scares you about the yeah. industry right now? Yeah. What are the others? What scares you about where the industry is headed? Well, I, I think, I think the good news is, is that the Times and the Post have figured out a business model here. Uh, of course, the Post has what every newspaper wishes they had. They have a billionaire who owns them, Jeff Bezos. And, uh, but Bezos has been smart enough to let their editor, Marty Barron, run the newspaper. And he was at the Boston Globe and you know, headed that spotlight team that mm -hmm. uh, did that wonderful story up there. Uh, the model that they are working under now is working for them. And if other papers uh, and other media companies can come to see that, uh, then I think uh, they can make it work at other levels. And I really do think it's possible. At CBS News, we now have the streaming service, CBSN. Uh, it's a 24-hour service that you only get on your phone or on your computer, not on television. And we found during the uh, the conventions uh, this 
uh, during the, the election, there were times when we were getting a much larger viewership on those yes. on the streaming service than we were on the network uh, when we were on. Uh, and so there are a lot of, lot of good things going on here, but uh, again, the real crisis is figuring out how to solve these problems at, at the low level, at, at medium to small towns around, around America. Uh, we have just got to find a way to do that. Texas Tribune is, is uh, doing something in, in the interim before we come up with the answer, but I do believe I do believe there are ways to do this. I mean, the secret to journalism, successful journalism, is having information that other people need. Mm -hmm. And my boss, David Rhodes, who's about half as old as me, the president of CBS News, uh, David says, if you've got information that somebody else needs and you can figure out a way to get it to them, he says, you can get a rent off that. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what journalism is about, and it, I think, it has to be private enterprise. I think, you know, something totally divorced from the government. Although, you know, PBS and NPR, uh, they, they do a wonderful job at what they do, but the core of American journalism has to be private enterprise, uh, independently gathered information that the government can't stop us from publishing. Uh, that's a good segue into, we're not gonna have a ton of time for audience questions, but I'm trying to do as many as I can. And this is a very good one. Does an entity like WikiLeaks have a legitimate role in our public discourse? Do I? Do, sorry, I'm a very low talker <clears throat> on a good day. Um, does an entity like WikiLeaks have a legitimate role in our public discourse? I, I don't, I'm not a WikiLeaks fan. I, 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 don't, I don't like that. I don't like what they're doing. I think, I think there's a difference in being a whistleblower and just dumping a whole bunch of information out and making public and putting lives at risk I think that's a very dangerous thing, and I, I'm, I, I just don't like anything about it. Well, that was, that was quick. Um, <laughs> does cable TV aggravate and accelerate the current quick process where uh, we are getting either making mistakes or getting things wrong? I'm adding on to what I think the questioner meant here. But uh, uh, is cable TV helping speed up a system that's already moving well, pretty fast. Well, uh, I think there's some very good journalism being done uh, by people like mm -hmm. at CNN. They've broken a couple of pretty good stories along the way here, and uh, I, uh, I think people like Jake Tapper mm -hmm. uh, is a fine journalist over at CNN. I thought Chris Wallace, uh, who moderated one of the mm -hmm. presidential debates mm -hmm. uh, this year, he's from Fox News, but I thought he did an excellent job. Uh, so I think, th I think there's some good stuff happening there. Uh, but I think what all of us, and not just cable, all of us have to be careful of, Maggie, is, you know, when I did Face the Nation uh, for 24 years, I always did a commentary at the end of the broadcast. And, but I always, there was always a sign that said commentary mm -hmm. down there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, yeah. and that was done at my insistence, people said, oh, well, they'll know that's guy." I said, no, I, I, want, I want this clearly labeled. This is commentary, right. and that separates this from the rest of the broadcast, uh, where I was trying to ask questions that I thought both sides would want to know uh, the answers to. It's very easy now to blend uh, opinion and analysis with, with factual reporting, and I think all of us have to always be on guard and can, and can do a better job. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask you a version of this earlier. Please try to compare media coverages lately of the United States, I think meaning the media coverage in the United States, to that of Russia and China. Any fake news going on out there or under gov government controls? I mean, you addressed this a few times uh, about the need for uh, private enterprise to be handling our information, yeah. but do you get a sense, I just think more broadly on a comparative basis, of any worry about sort of mission creep in what the president says in terms of his threats about the media? Is it all words, or have we reached a point where it's something a little more insidious? Well, uh, I think our, I think Western journalism, I think uh, the American press is, I don't know any other country in the world that I think has a better press. I think, I think we're better than any of them. And, and you know, we're so far superior to what you're getting from state 
uh, government from, from China, where the government is the news. The government not only controls the news, but decides what the news is, and the Russians. The Russians are, are, are up to some really, uh, really serious things now. Uh, there's a woman at CSIS named Heather Conley who wrote a book called The Russian Playbook. She went and studied, I think it was five different countries across uh, Europe and what the Russians were doing there. And the bottom line is the Russians don't run their t tanks across the borders anymore. They don't have to. They found a cheaper way uh, to take control in these countries. Okay. They're, you know, they're bribing the local politicians. They're, they're putting out false information to try to destroy the credibility of the press and other government institutions. They're loaning money to the local uh, real estate folks who want to uh, build uh, new buildings and all of that. And uh, if any of this sounds familiar, uh, but this is what they're doing, and this has been going on for quite some time, and this is what they're doing now, and this really concerns me about how they're trying to meddle in, in our elections, and there's no question, I don't think any person, any responsible person in the foreign policy establishment of this country would tell you otherwise. There, there's no question they're trying to do this. Joe Nye, up at Harvard, who's uh, been in, in and out of government and is an expert on uh, foreign policy, he says that he thinks the Russians were trying to destroy or at least uh, 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 damage the credibility of the press with all this stuff, these uh, false reports they were putting into our media. And he says, uh, were they colluding with the Russian, uh, with, with the Trump administration? He said, I, I don't know the answer to that, but he said basically they did get Trump as a bonus. Mm -hmm. and. And so whether they were, and, and as far as Trump, I, you know, he seems to be the only one that has any doubts about this. And I, 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 I don't know why he's taking that position, but I really wonder about it. Mm. I mean, he, he seems to be someone who has something to hide on that front. And uh, whether he does or not, I have no knowledge of that. But, but I'm just he's behaving, looking he's at behaving it. behaving like someone who has something to hide, is what you're saying? Yeah. And, but, I mean, I don't mean that I think he's guilty by mm -hmm. saying that. I'm just saying his actions suggest to me that he has something to hide. What it is, I don't know. And maybe it may be nothing. Maybe I'm totally wrong about that. I'm going to do two more here. This is an interesting question, and I'm wondering what you came, that, that I can't answer, to be clear, um, when it relates to New York Times. Uh, why don't the major players, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Papers, invest funds in the Rust Belt and other news lacking areas to assist uh, the poorer, I think, people interested um, populations in this, in, this, in this geographic location so that they can see real news? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, do you think that there is something more that, in the same way that the Texas Trib model looks at, at you know, areas where papers have died out or underserved areas, is there more that the major papers could be doing? Is there what? Is more? there more the major papers could be doing to try to revive in, yeah. the, in the interest instead of competition? I, I think probably uh, so, and I think uh, uh, the networks as well. Uh, but here's the reason it's so difficult, and it again goes back to the fact that these local newspapers are shutting down, and there's no newspaper out there now. And, you know, uh, your paper, CBS News, we all have stringers, and they used mm -hmm. to have stringers mm -hmm. at those local newspapers. Well, they're not there anymore. Should we, should we, should do, is there an obligation, given the assault the media is under uh, in this country, uh, and given that our president describes our, our accurate reporting as fake, is there an obligation to band together, uh, either more formally or informally, to try to prop up other news outlets to allow other news outlets to develop. We know what's gone is gone, but is there a responsibility of existing major entities to try to do more to bring them back? Yes, and I think we just had to put more emphasis on trying to, to get to the truth. And, and you know, we had to be very careful about saying we all bind, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're all bound together. I think we should be very careful about standards, ethics, mm -hmm and all of that, and I think we should, you know, we should all adhere to that. But to say, you know, we're all gonna gang up, 
mm -hmm. and become one. That's not what makes the journalism what it is. Mm -hmm. That's not the great strength. The great strength of American journalism is seeing the New York Times and the Washington Post. You're basically in an old-fashioned newspaper war right now, and I think it's the reader uh, that really benefits from that because you're both making each other better, and that's what competition mm -hmm. always does. And so I, we've just all got to remember what we're doing is very important, and it's crucial to American to American democracy, and understand we're not always going to be the most popular person in the room. And I think, I think, where I work and where you work, we we all understand that. Uh, but the other part is to understand we're we're right in the middle of something. Walt Mossberg, who is a great mm. uh, uh, technology, you talk about uh, him a lot in the book. Writer, and I talk about him in the book. Uh, he's and it's a great little story. If I can just di sure. uh, diverge from this just for a minute. Walt was covering foreign policy for the, and had been for years, for the uh, Wall Street Journal. And he went to his editor, Norm Perlstein, and he said, you know, I'm just tired of writing about foreign policy. He said, what I want to do is write a column about technology. And Perlstein said, well, that's well and good. But he said, you know, I get a feeling the Soviet Union's going to collapse. <laughs> and he said, so I want you to stay on this story uh, until that happens. Uh, and and uh, he said, then after that happens, well, then you can write this column for six months, and if it works, you can keep doing it. Well, as if on cue, the Soviet Union collapsed <laughs> a short time after that. And, and he was there to write about it. Then he started this column on technology, and he, he uh, it became very, very popular, and it was a blog, and then... Uh, he and a, and a partner of his broke away from the journal and, and sold the column, I think it's the Dow Jones or something. Anyway, they made millions of dollars on it and, and became kind of the first journalist uh, entrepreneurs uh, in this new age. And then he's still around. But what, what Walt said was, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, sometimes when you're in the middle of something, you don't understand it's really happening. And he said, we're right in the middle of this great mm -hmm. uh, revolution uh, in journalism, this change in how we get the news. And he said, it's going to be a while before we kind of sort it all out and understand where we really are. And I mean, I think that's where we are right now. That's true. And I think we're out of time. Thank you well, so thank you, much Maggie. for doing this. Thank you all. And thank you for being here. Thank you. That was great. Now I have to. I have to. <laughs> My wife is always afraid. No. <laughs>